was 1949 and Kazimir Mocharski had just been thrown inside a communist death row cell, but he was not alone. He recognized the other man. He had seen that face before. It was on a photograph, six years prior. He cursed it out many times. Attached to it was the following note. This is SS Gruppenführer Jürgen Strupp, your next target. Pause. How the hell could this have happened? Are you telling me that a member of the anti-Nazi resistance, known as the Home Army of Poland, was housed in the same jail cell as a Nazi war criminal? What is going on? In short, Stalinism. But let's delve deeper. Unlike some other countries, which we will not mention by name so as to spare them the embarrassment, Poland never formed a collaborationist regime alongside the Nazi invader. You see, in those other countries that we won't mention by name, the situation was that the liberal and conservative elites collaborated with the f***ing Nazis, and it was largely up to the communists to pick up the mantle and resist the occupying forces. In Poland, however, the largest resistance network had a conservative and liberal character. These forces eventually formed the so-called Home Army, which was like if the bourgeois democratic state moved underground to resist the Nazis. Of course, it was also resisting the Soviet forces which occupied the eastern part of Poland. It is undeniable that those people committed heroic deeds, risked and often lost their lives undermining the German war effort and helping some Jews escape with their lives. However, its latter doings became increasingly more controversial. As Soviet troops pushed the front back into Poland, it was becoming increasingly clear that the communist forces were, on one hand, liberators, but on the other, occupants. After the Nazi threat had been defeated, some home army fighters laid down their arms so as not to fight with perhaps their political enemies, but after all, also their compatriots. On the other hand, some continued fighting exclusively against the Soviet and Polish communists. Pause. Look. I am against national myths. We need to pull back a little bit and talk about dogma, ligma and shit like that. It is an undeniable fact that the United States were built on genocide. Like, somebody else owned that land before Anson and Hunter and whatever other wasp names there are. So these guys shoot some Indian guy, they rape his wife, and they put their Mac mansions over their ancient burial grounds. Literally you need weapons grade copium to claim otherwise. And yet, when the Star Spangled Banner is flown, it undeniably represents the triumph of the Republic over monarchy, of humanism over tyranny, of freedom of speech over censorship, and of capitalism over feudalism. Even the evil Karl Marx can respect the achievements of this great country. However, the state wants to smooth over these contradictions and basically have you believe only the good things when your Ford F-150 runs over a fentanyl zombie or whatever other problems you Americans may face. It is beneficial to the state to have you repeat over and over in your head America is great, America is great, America is great, rather than America is built on genocide. It builds state legitimacy to implant in its people a very dogmatic view of the world so that they are docile citizens. Why have my taxes go to improve society if America is great already? So now, picture in your head the nation of Poland. It may be true that the Home Army was largely a heroic organization and it may also be true that a large portion of the element that continued fighting after the Soviets took over was composed of fanatical extremists, some eager to shoot at civilians or even to murder ethnic minorities like Lithuanians. But you look at Poland now, a state which no longer guarantees its citizens jobs, houses, cars. It is beneficial to the state to make myths, to have its citizens repeat over and over in their heads, Poland is great, Poland is great, Poland is great, to build state legitimacy. Despite the fact that we have an ample supply of Poles who were anti-communists and also committed good deeds, the state insists on blanket statements and whitewashing the most criminal elements of the anti-communist resistance. And its Poles are a lot like America. At least Poland has the advantage of not really having a collaborationist element because you have countries like Ukraine or the Baltic states, which are constantly clutching at straws and making Nazi-adjacent war criminals their national heroes. Perfect example of that is the rehabilitation of Stefan Bandera, a Nazi-adjacent perpetrator of crimes against humanity, or, if you ask the Ukrainian state, a national anti-communist hero. Stepan Bandera was one of the authors of the Ukrainian State Restoration Act. Historians consider its proclamation in June 1941 to be a great step towards the independence of Ukraine. But you will repeat in your head, Ukraine is great, Ukraine is great, as your country gets sold off to Western hedge funds. Pause. So now, in light of having explained this idea of dogmatic thinking, we can return to our story. You have the Home Army, which is not exactly a purely heroic organization. Would it surprise you to find out that the communists viewed it in a completely sounded down way as a purely criminal institution? It's funny how easy it is to spot dogmatic thinking in others while we ourselves also indulge in it. It is purely dogmatic thinking that crushed a human being whose name was Kazimir Wojcicki, a man who for all intents and purposes was on the right side of history. He, I believe, represents the heroic side of the Home Army and yet he would be placed on death row by the communists and put in a prison cell with a massive war criminal. His cellmate, Jorgen Strupp, was, outside of the usual suspects, 
probably the most hated man in Poland. He was responsible for liquidating the Jewish quarter of Warsaw and the suppression of the ghetto uprising that started in response. His deed is particularly rooted in Polish consciousness as one of the most heinous crimes of the Nazi occupant. Pause, I don't want you to take my word for it, you need to be the judge of these characters. So, who exactly was Kazimierz Moczarski before finding himself on death row? A man with social democratic tendencies, he works in journalism and law. Based in Warsaw, during the war he joined the Home Army. There he worked in their secret judiciary branch. Remember when I described the Home Army as a bourgeois democracy forced underground by the occupant? Well, alongside fighting, it also attempted to carry out some vestigial functions of the state. One of these was to put Nazis and their collaborators, as well as those who extorted Jews in hiding, on trial. These courts were strange in that the defendant didn't know that he was on trial, and the defense had to make a case for them without their presence. Because the underground did not have prison facilities, the the only form of punishment would be a bullet to the head. In the branch for Warsaw and the surrounding area alone, hundreds of such verdicts were reached and dozens of the most notorious criminals were assassinated or executed. Other than that, Kazimir worked in the propaganda and intelligence units. Why he would end up being so severely persecuted was likely because of how high up the chain of command he was in the resistance. Finally, Kazimir was directly involved in a few guerrilla operations. One such example was a raid on a hospital which held Poles captured by the Nazis. Those held inside were often torture victims from a nearby prison. After firing warning shots, the conspirators disarmed the numerous German police officers and freed the captives. His overall activity perfectly captures the vibe of the Home Army as both an underground state and a military resistance. One day, while working in the intelligence, he was given a photo of Jorgen's troop. While he wouldn't have been the one to fire the bullet had the assassination been executed, he was involved in fact-finding about the target, spying on the SS general as he rode his horse in the local city park. Unfortunately, always well guarded by his loyal SS personnel, if Strupp was not moved out of Warsaw shortly after, it was very likely that he would have been killed by the Home Army. During the Warsaw Uprising, Moczarski was responsible for radio transmissions in his district. He continued being active in the resistance after the uprising was suppressed in August 1944. After Soviet authorities took over Poland, he urged his co-conspirators to give up fighting and turned himself in. Arrested in November 1945, he was initially sentenced to 10 years in prison. This sentence was eventually upgraded to capital punishment. In 1949, he was moved to death row cell inhabited by none other than Jorgen Strupp himself. Spoiler alert! Moczarski lived through the encounter. It seems that the authorities were not eager to actually carry out his execution, as he stayed on death row until after the death of Stalin. In 1956, he was released from prison, and many years later he was officially pardoned by the communist courts. In 1970s, he published his account of the many conversations that he had with Jorgen Strupp, who himself was thankfully executed back in 1952. He died aged 68 shortly after his book was sent to print. It is from this book, Conversations with Executioner, that we can learn about the other protagonist of this story. SS Gruppenführer Jürgen Strupp, a lower German from the city of Detmold, the capital of the Principality of Lieb. Lieb was a tiny state that belongs to a princely family since time immemorial and through a fluke of history remained sovereign as one of the smaller states within the German Empire. The family built an opulent castle and within its shadow grew up the future SS general. As he recalled, it was his lifelong ambition to himself one day possess such a castle and to command a microstate full of peasants. During the Second World War, his dream nearly came true and he often dreamed from within his prison cell of having such an estate somewhere in Ukraine had the war gone his way. He was by all accounts a true believer of Nazism. During the trials, he seems to completely disregard the idea that Jews were human beings and he never flinched when confronted with the death toll of his actions against those people. He built his career in the SS during the occupation of Ukraine, where he started off chasing and slaughtering Jewish militias through the forests of Galicia and ended up overseeing the construction of a highway by Jewish slave labor. The prisoners were seen as expendable, and his corrupt leadership stole a lion's share of the money sent by the government to house and feed the laborers. Many of them died. Despite the enormous death toll, the construction progressed as planned, which brought him many honors. Having achieved a high officer rank within the SS, the rest of his military career was spent in conflict comfort and luxury, and he was given largely farcical assignments. For instance, in 1943 he would get to drive a luxurious BMW limousine allotted to him by the SS to Austria, where he trained a mountaineer division. These SS men went on hikes simulating the conditions of the Caucasus and were getting ready to be sent to Georgia to chase after partisans. Thankfully, the Germans never crossed into Georgia, which meant that Strupp never got to realize his murderous plans there. After the plan fell through, he was sent to Warsaw. 
Poland in the interwar period was a multi-ethnic state, with Jews being the second largest minority, comprising about 9% of the population. Although there were incidents of anti-Semitic violence and the state apparatus was not adequately protecting them, they enjoyed relative equality to Poles. One example of how Jews were discriminated against was that in universities conservative deans could force Jewish students to sit on one part of the auditorium away from Polish students. These efforts were boycotted by liberal Polish students who violated the rules and sat together with the Jews. This is pretty bad but you can compare it to America, which maintained segregated schools half a century later. After the German invasion, the occupant enforced its anti-Semitic policy on the Jewish people. In Warsaw in 1940, a large portion of the city, north of the center, was closed off and Jews were forced to relocate there. Housing 400,000 people, it became the largest Jewish ghetto in Europe. Although the Jews were dispossessed of their property and forced to work as slaves from the age of 14, it was not until March 1942 that the Holocaust began. In January 1941, it was made illegal for Jews to leave the ghetto or for the Poles to go into the ghetto without a special permit, while in November, the penalty was increased to capital punishment. In the spring of 1942, ghettos in other Polish cities were beginning to be liquidated by the Nazis. Few people who avoided deportation to concentration camps or even escaped from them managed to get in touch with the Warsaw Ghetto Jews. However, those isolated reports were not enough to make the Warsaw Jews realize that the final solution was already underway. It was a widely held belief that the Warsaw Ghetto was too big and too economically productive to be liquidated. And yet, in 1942, half of the population was loaded onto trains, which, although they were told were going to relocate them in the east, in reality were headed to concentration camps. Initially, Jewish refugees from other parts of Poland were loaded onto the trains, then those unemployed. The Nazis claimed that they were going to be given housing and employment in the east. After loading up trainfuls of Jews who were willing, parts of the ghetto would be cordoned off and its residents loaded forcefully under the threat of being shot. The vast majority of Jews met a terrible fate. The concentration camp in Treblinka was headed by not only a genocidal Nazi, but also a complete Cretan. In his quest to impress his superiors, Infrit Embrel ordered excessive amounts of prisoners to be delivered to the camp. The train started backing up, and many people died inside carts from thirst or lack of air. Furthermore, the bodies were not burned sufficiently fast and started decomposing in spring heat. This led to newer transports being aware that a mass murder was underway and being disobedient and trying to escape. This contradicts the myth of Holocaust as a perfectly orchestrated machine. The so-called Rest Ghetto, housing some 60,000 surviving Jews, was reduced to a collection of factories and housing for the enslaved. In 1943, when the Nazis sought to destroy this last pocket of Jewish population in Warsaw, inhabitants of the ghetto were more prepared. It was far clearer then that they were facing almost certain death and that those civilians had no other choice but to die fighting against the Nazis. Through contacts with the Polish resistance and through materials smuggled out of factories, the Jewish people built up fortifications and armed themselves. Furthermore, they had good intelligence this time and were aware that the Nazis planned to finally destroy the Jewish quarter ahead of time. When the German SS entered the ghetto, they were met with armed resistance and a truck was destroyed with Molotov cocktails. The Germans, in a huge embarrassment to their forces, were routed and forced to retreat on the first day. At this point, Jürgen's troop had just arrived in Warsaw and he took over from his humiliated predecessor. He led the German forces, which ultimately killed all members of the armed resistance, as well as countless civilians. The fighting was extremely brutal, and the Germans were using anti-aircraft guns pointed horizontally at nearby buildings, as well as howitzers they got from Wehrmacht. Especially brutal and deadly were flamethrowers, which the Nazis deployed on buildings occupied by civilians, and then watched and laughed as people jumped out of high-rise buildings. Very few people were taken prisoner, as most were simply killed on the spot, or burned alive. Those that did survive were sent to concentration camps. The uprising was over when the Germans surrounded a bunker built by the Jewish underground fighters, which served as the headquarters. Most fighters killed themselves, but a few managed to escape through one passage that was not secured by the Nazis. Unfortunately, all those who made it out of the bunker perished in fighting with the Nazis some days later. Then, the Grand Synagogue of Warsaw was demolished, and shortly afterwards, nearly all buildings of the ghetto were also razed, with the Church of St. Augustine being the only building that survived to the end of the war. However, make no mistake, the Nazis were extremely anti-Christian, and one of its priests was outright murdered by the SS, while the other was sent to a concentration camp for helping Jews in the ghetto. The way that Stroop recounts the events of the uprising says a lot about how f***ed in the head the Nazis were. 
He sees himself as a noble knight, while Jewish fighters, who evade him by hiding in sewers, are often compared to rats. There is this basic disconnect between him and reality. He doesn't respect the enemy's courage in fighting for a lost cause to preserve their and their family's dignity, and simultaneously thinks that fighting an asymmetric war, where he has all the advantages and is also generally slaughtering civilians, is somehow courageous. He meticulously describes returning to a mansion after each day of fighting, eating truffle stuffed chickens and taking warm baths while the people he is fighting have obviously been on starvation rations for over three years. He also sounds deranged. In one sentence he claims that doing the holocaust in Galicia was beneficial as it got rid of the Jews and allowed the Nazis to pit Poles and Ukrainians against one another, and that it was a logical war tactic, while in another he claims that fighting the Jewish self-defense organizations took up a lot of resources that could have been spent elsewhere. He was a deeply unrepentant Nazi. In fact, he held out from capitulating to the Allies slightly longer than Himmler, the leader of the SS, did. It is impossible to understand an SS general. Like, sure, we can say that he internalized the idea that the Jews were not human, but even if we run with that, then when he set fire to buildings and watched people jump out of windows while he shot at them and laughed, this violates some basic human notion of morality. No sane person would do that type of violence even to an animal or an inanimate object. I guess we can say that he thought the Jews were the source of all evil. This kind of helps rationalize his actions, but it begs another question. What sort of a brain deformation do you have to have to think that? The women, children of all ages, and also men, who are people basically just like you, that those people literally make evil exist on earth? How could such a stupid idea have infected the minds of millions? Reading Mocharski's story, you don't come away with some sort of great realization about the nature of Nazism. The only conclusion that I made in the end is that Jürgen Strupp was a literal rabbit dog. You don't try to understand why this dog bites, because the dog itself doesn't really know why. You take that hacking pupper behind the shed and you shoot him in the f***ing head. Stroop, the most hated man in Warsaw, would be seen by passerbys and an occasional spy of the home army, perhaps one going by the name Mocharski, in city parks, riding a white horse, surrounded by SS foot soldiers, as well as Lithuanians and Latvians under his command. Justice did not catch up to him as soon as it could have because he was sent to Greece. It was a cozy assignment, almost like a vacation. He was involved in politics and in overseeing the Greek police force from a comfortable office in Athens. Afterwards came an assignment to West Germany. Stroop got to live out his childhood fantasy there. He was given a mansion stolen from a Jew that ran away overseas in the 30s. He would command some 100,000 SS police officers, which were far less busy at home. However, luxury eventually devolved as the Allied bombings intensified. At some point, he was proud to be the only person in town whose place had all the glass windows intact. Other people had to board up their windows after they broke from Allied raids because there was a shortage of glass. This is where Stroop made the biggest mistake of his career. When a pilot crashes over your territory, it is a war crime to not admit him as a POW, but rather to kill him on sight. Unfortunately for Stroop, he did just that, and like seven or eight times as well. He made an honestly pretty understandable justification for allowing that to happen. The people flying those planes had terrorized his community, and people wanted retribution for the destruction of property and human life that the pilots caused. Nevertheless, this put him on a list of Nazis that the Allies were keenly interested in. Pause. So now, let's look at what happened to other SS Gruppenführers. Let's see if Stroop could have gotten away with murdering hundreds of of Jews had he not killed eight John McCain's on the Western Front. Number one. Karl Zex, a complete moron who caught a corruption charge in the SS, the irony being that the SS was mostly interested in corruption anyways. Being accused of that meant some really comedic shit like US politician level schemes. Anyway, he kills himself because of that. Two. Kurt Wittje, indicted by the Reich Central Office for Combating Homosexuality and Abortion, which sounds like something that would be headquartered in Florida and founded by the Koch brothers. Lost his SS rank. Afterwards, he stole some businesses from Czech Jews and was eventually executed by the Soviets. Number 3. Richard Wendler did similar shit to Stroop, but slightly to the east, in Lublin. He supposedly slipped away from American courts by using a false identity, spent three years convicted by the German Federal Republic. In 1955, he was allowed to practice law again. Otto Gustav von Wachter, a terribly criminal person. He was the governor of Krakow and then Galicia. Ran away to the fucking Vatican from Austria and Italy. That's not all. He fucking killed himself by swimming every day in the polluted river Tiber until his liver fucking exploded in 1949. Bruno Streckenbach, leader of Einsatzgruppen 1, a mobile death squad known for committing the Holocaust by bullets. His name came up multiple times in Nuremberg trials, never persecuted. Jakub Sporenberg, 
war crimes in Minsk and Lublin, captured by the British, given up to Poland and executed in 1952. Max Simon, war crimes in Italy. Also back home, he had a farmer hanged for taking guns away from Hitler Jugend children and throwing them in a lake. Afterwards, he also had the mayor hanged for not wanting to certify the hanging. Captured by Americans, British sentenced him to death, which turned into life imprisonment, which turned into nine years in prison. Hans Joachim Rieke, responsible for something called the Hunger Plan. Anyway, let's not dwell too much on what that might mean because he only did like four years under the British. Heinz Reinfarth, suppress the Warsaw Uprising. Think else with flamethrowers burning an entire city to the ground, often with many people still inside the buildings. He got held up for the duration of Nuremberg trials, then let go. He became the mayor of an island resort town of the coast of Germany. Karl Friedrich von Packler Berghaus. He missed the golden ticket and capitulated to the Soviets in Czechia while Americans were almost in sight five days after the end of World War II. Then he promptly killed himself. Hermann Pries. War crimes in Belgium. Sentenced by the Allies to 20 years in prison, got out after nine. Otto Ochlendorf. Commanded an Einstein's Gruppen. Holocaust by bullets in the south of Ukraine. Actually got got by Americans, hanged in 1951. Arthur Nebe. On one hand, he was an Einstein's Gruppe guy. On the other, he was part of the plot to overthrow Hitler. Even more interestingly, he held out in hiding for a very long time afterwards, killed by the Nazis in 1945, over a year later. Heinrich Miller, also the chief of Gestapo. Last reported seen in Führer Bunker. Body was never found. 50% chance that he died in the 80s in Brazil. Gork Lomer. He was the soup Nazi in charge of supplying concentration camps with food and clothing. Tried by the US. Death sentence. Committed to life imprisonment. Committed to 15 years. Served 9. Hans Lammerding. War crimes in France. In an absolute boss move, West Germany refused to give him up to French, so he served no time. Wilhelm Kube. Made the mistake of hiring a Soviet partisan as his mate. Blown up in 1943. Fritz Katzmann. He's probably the most similar to Jürgen Strupp in that he first came up with the idea of making a detailed report of war crimes and calling it the Katzmann Report, which Strupp did with the Strupp Report. Managed to adopt a false identity, escaped to a German island on the Baltic Sea. Supposedly died a few years later from an illness, but he could have escaped to Brazil, who knows. Konstantin Kammerhofer, massive war criminal, worked as Himmler's personal envoy to Croatia, which is a big red flag. Imprisoned by the Americans, witnessed in Nuremberg trials, not charged, lived in West Germany. Albert Hoffmann, regional leader of the Nazi parties in Silesia and Westphalia, personally inspected Auschwitz during his tenure, ordered the killing of Allied crashed pilots, got only four years. This list is not comprehensive, but contains tidbits from the 40 Wikipedia articles that I read before realizing that it was too ambitious and, frankly, too boring to list like the whole 60 people's biographies. The general trend was that a few of them died in combat, most of the ones that escaped to the West either got their sentences commuted or got away with their crimes altogether, sometimes by using false identities. In this context, Jürgen Strupp was one of the few that got extradited from a Western country to the East. Admittedly, a lot of guys bit down on a cyanide pill while in Western custody, probably because they had foreknowledge of their upcoming trip to the East. So Jürgen Strupp made a comparatively bad fate in comparison with a lot of his compatriots who managed to get away with it. One fateful evening, a guard knocked on the prison door. SS Gruppenführer Jürgen Strupp had spent the last seven years in prison. All this because he was afraid of taking his own life, which was a path many of his people chose. Being on death row for a large chunk of that time made him come to peace with what was coming, and he didn't fear death anymore. According to letters sent by the persecutor some years later to inquiring Mocharski, his execution went smoothly, with Strupp remaining composed as a noose was put around his neck. No final wishes, no screaming about the return of the Fourth Reich. Just stoic acceptance.